let's get started. So, uh, I'm Rakesh Kaul, and I'll come sit for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so, just to start everybody on a relaxed note, I think I have had several, I have managed 400 different consumer brands in my life that have reported to me, out of which probably half of them were food brands. Mm -hmm. And when I have nightmares, typically my nightmares revolve around the tomato. <laughs> because I spent a fair amount of my life working with the team to figure out the perfect tomato. The perfect American tomato is a tomato uh, with a skin that is roughly like leather, so that when you load it up in the trucks, you know, it doesn't squish. It should act like a tennis ball. <laughs> and then when you bring the tomato, then the only way to remove that s skin is to put it in an acid bath. And now the poor tomato, uh, what happens to it is when all of that solidity goes in the skin, then what's left inside is just water. So the problem is that when you want to make ketchup with that tomato and you do this to the bottle, it comes out. Now you can't have that, right? Go ahead, you can't have that with the tomato. So great scientists spent a lot of time figuring out how to deliver the perfect tomato to our young children. And so some smart guy came up with the idea that if we take this liquidy stuff and we throw it in a device that was originally created for smashing atoms. Mm -hmm. You liking the story so far? Just, I'm, I'm the warm-up warm comic here, right? And if you put it in a centrifuge and you smash this fluid, it sort of causes it all to mix. And the stuff that comes out is actually viscous. And so you get that beautiful flow of a viscous ketchup. Mm -hmm. So that's what my generation spent time doing creating what we thought was the perfect food. Now, of course, we're all from India, this is I see. We all know that when darkness like that spreads through a land, then even, <laughs> eventually an avatar emerges, right? There is an avatar that emerges. And this avatar that we have in Kanchan Koya, I was reading about her background. Oh my God, you know, <laughs> a PhD from Harvard Medical School, and then she decides to research on the cancer uh, properties, fighting properties of turmeric, which eventually then leads her into a fascinating journey. A journey that really started with Charaka when he wrote the first seminal textbook on Ayurveda. Charaka is uh, my compatriot from Kashmir. He was a Kashmiri, and I'll just end on this note. Uh, do read Charaka along with Kanchan's book, which he will <laughs> autograph for you. And she's been kind enough to also say that she'll give a promotion code to those of you who want to order it online. But ladies, one of the things you like about Charaka is that he actually says, every six months, thou should check into a spa and just get a nice massage. <laughs> so with that, Kanchan, it's all yours. And I can't tell you how much we're looking forward to hearing and learning and enjoying your talk. Thank you so much for the very kind, generous introduction. And so amazing to be here. I'm going to stand up so I don't kind of <laughs> um, let the early morning-ish get the better of me. So yeah, I, I loved how you positioned, um, you know, the, the, the food scientists working on ketchup and trying to get a processed food to have a certain consistency. And I would say that really the generation now and the, the, the zeitgeist now is about going back to the basics. It's about going back to nature. And that's very much what my book, Spice Spice Baby, and my platform has been about, that a lot of what we seek from a healing perspective, from a medicinal perspective, is really found as close to the earth as possible and not necessarily in a processed food jar, right? So it's really kind of coming back full circle to that ancient wisdom. And my book is really about shedding modern scientific light on a lot of ancient wisdom that many of us grew up with in India because Ayurveda is part of our DNA. It's like every household has its own version of different natural remedies. And I grew up in that same vein. Um, and then when I came here to study modern medical research and found that my lab at Harvard Medical School was looking at 
bioactive compounds in the likes of turmeric and studying them for their anti-cancer properties, I was really pleasantly surprised, um, shocked and amused that all of this ancient wisdom over 5,000 years old was coming to a head now with modern research. So my book really attempts to shed light on the science-backed health benefits of spices, which many of us have grown up with, really dives deep into the science and then shows you how you can incorporate these really beautiful, vibrant, natural ingredients into your daily life, whether or not you like to turn on the stove, so there's lots of no-cook simple <laughs> recipes in there, and whether or not you want to eat Indian food. So the recipes are globally inspired because this is something I felt very strongly about. We Indians use spices day in, day out without giving it a second thought, but millions of people around the world are really, really scared of them intimidated by them so a big part of my mission was to demystify spices for a global audience so that everyone can enjoy their kind of medicinal magic so I thought I would start just by reading um, it's it's a book reading so and my book is not really you know it's a, it's a cookbook but it's more than that and so I thought I would start with just reading my introduction which I think will set the stage um, I hope really well for what this mission and this entire messaging is about and then I would love to make it as interactive as possible so please ask questions and you know let's really um, fall in love with spices together so from my book page 8 growing up in India spices were literally everywhere not only did I enjoy them in my food every single day but like most Indian households, they were also an indispensable part of my family's medicine cabinet. When a sore throat would pay an unwelcome visit, my grandmother would concoct her version of a turmeric latte, turmeric, milk, cardamom, and sugar. If a stomach bug got the better of me, ginger and cumin seeds steeped in hot water with honey would be waiting on my nightstand. I never gave any of this much thought, but spices and their aroma, flavor, and health-boosting powers were an integral part of my life. Fast forward to 2005, when I was a PhD student at Harvard Medical School, and my lab began studying the anti-cancer properties of curcumin, the active compound in turmeric. Suffice to say, I thought of my grandmother and smiled. I was amazed that modern science was validating what ancient wisdom has known all along. When I became a mother, I wanted to give my son the best possible start with nutritious, flavorful food. Again, I turned to spices. I began adding cardamom to his pureed pears, cinnamon to his sweet potatoes, and turmeric to his avocado and lentils. I was surprised that several of my mom friends expressed shock. Is that allowed? Spices for baby? Have you checked with your pediatrician? I had in fact checked with my pediatrician and her stance was unequivocally in favor of flavor for babies. There is no scientific basis for offering babies bland food. Yes, excess salt can wait until the baby's kidneys mature by the end of the first year, but spices and herbs have the power to wake up their palates, setting them on a course for a lifetime of adventurous, healthy eating. I realized that I had always take, I realized what I had always taken for granted. So many misconceptions persist around what we can and can't feed our kids, so Spice Spice Baby was born. The most common misunderstandings about feeding babies and kids spices and even enjoying them ourselves daily are that spices are hot and therefore unsuitable for tiny taste buds or those with sensitive palates. Many also believe that cooking with spices means cooking complicated, unfamiliar food. Not so unfamiliar to us, but unfamiliar to you know people around the world who didn't grow up with them. I wrote this first of its kind book to debunk these myths and demystify spices for you. I combined my science expertise with my love for cooking to bring to light the health enhancing powers of spices and make them daily heroes in your kitchen. In the first part of this book, you will learn about the healing qualities of 15 spices validated by modern medical research. In the second part, you will find 100 recipes incorporating health-boosting spices for your whole family, from babies all the way to adults. 
A few recipes are readers' favorites from the Spice Spice Baby blog, but most are unique to this book. They are globally inspired, simple, nourishing, and delicious. What we feed our children shapes their health, happiness, and sense of adven adventure around food. We all strive to bring our families together around one healthful, delicious meal each day that each member will love. I hope the use of spices helps in that process of building flavor and raising better eaters with love and spice. So that's really, um, you know, just setting the stage for sort of how this whole Spice Spice Baby mission came about and the book was um, sort of followed three years of me being a food blogger um, at SpiceSpiceBaby.com and so yeah I mean it's really been sort of an adventure since then. Um, I'm just going to dive in really quick into a lot of this you guys might know but even for us Indians who grew up with a lot of these spices sometimes we are shocked <laughs> to learn about their remarkable history and how they've really shaped our history, our geography as, as, a, as, as a globe. I'm trying to get this to presentation mode. Let's see. Anyone? <laughs> oh, here, this little guy here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So... Right, so as we know, spices are really nature's ultimate gifts to us. Um, they have the power not just to enhance the flavor in our food with their vibrancy and various flavor notes, but to also impact our health. Um, many are surprised to learn that the quest for spices and the quest for controlling their production and distribution and supply chain has really shaped our history as a human race in a profound way. Um, Christopher Columbus was actually in search of spices when he accidentally landed on the shores of America. I don't know if you knew that, but I didn't, and I was kind of like, wow. Uh, when the Portuguese conqueror Vasco da Gama landed in southern India, his men literally leapt off the ship chanting for Christ and spices. And in 14th century Germany, a pound of nutmeg could, no joke, buy seven large oxen. So spices were really currency. And like I said, um, the pursuit of their control shaped our geography, our wars, and our history. So of course, spices today are not so difficult to find. You don't have to you know, set sail to other shores to get them. They are accessible worldwide. They are much more affordable than they used to be. But I would argue that people are still very intimidated by them, especially people who didn't grow up in cultures where they're a part and parcel of the everyday. And the mention of spices still evokes an association with ethnic food. People are like, yeah, I don't really want to eat curry every day. And incorporating them into mainstream Western cooking can feel intimidating to many. And many questions abound. So people wonder, you know, what do I pair with nutmeg? Does it have to be with savory or sweet dishes? What about cumin, turmeric? Um, what fruits and vegetables and meats combine with cardamom and clove and so on? So really... In my conversations with people since I started Spice Spice Baby, I am always very surprised at how intimidated people are. People have literally sometimes never even seen a cardamom pod, let alone use it in chai or rice or any of that stuff. So there is a lot of room to educate and inspire people to really embrace these really wonderful um, natural ingredients. So really... In this book, on my platform, and today, well, I don't have to do it as much today with you guys, but my goal is always to demystify spices, to share their science-backed benefits, and to inspire their use daily in their kitchens. And uh, before I go back to reading from the book and answering any questions, I just want to lay, um, lay the land for why we should even bother with spices, what makes them so unique from a health boosting perspective. There's lots of amazing health boosting foods in nature, but spices are unique because one is they bring all this remarkable flavor, right? So they're really packed with so many myriad flavor notes, whether it's smoky, sweet, earthy, peppery, citrusy, and other flavor profiles. And unfortunately, most people think of spices as spicy and then they sort of back off. And this is a big part of my messaging um, and mission is you know, most spices are aromatic and wonderfully flavorful and not actually hot and spicy. So if you don't like spicy food, you can still really enjoy spices. 
Um, spices can reduce the need for excess fat and some of the unhealthy additions that we often put into dishes like salt, sugar. So for example, cardamom is my favorite spice to add a dessert-like quality to dishes, reducing the need for refined sugar. Um, and we know now that spices have been revered for their health benefits for thousands of years and modern science is really proving that this is indeed the case. So this is, again, not foreign to you guys um, being of Indian origin, but this is just to give you a sense of all the different flavor notes that different spices can have beyond just spicy. So cardamom is one of my favorites, like I said, for its floral dessert-like qualities, cumin, earthy, peppery, leathery, fennel, sweet, herbaceous. I mean, it's really a treasure trove of flavor, and my book will argue a treasure trove of health benefits as well. So what gives spices their really remarkable health-enhancing powers is the presence of something we call phytochemicals. This is just a fancy scientific word for saying phyto is plant-based and chemicals are compounds. So spices come packed with plant-based beneficial compounds that scientists are now isolating and studying and telling you can impact this aspect of your health, can impact that aspect of your molecular you know, pathophysiology. So really, really just a treasure trove of plant-based compounds to study. So for some examples, cinnamaldehyde is a compound in cinnamon. Curcumin, I mentioned earlier, is the compound in turmeric. Cloves have eugenol. Capsaicin and cayenne pepper is being studied as a powerful anti-inflammatory, and on and on and on. And a lot of those details are um, outlined in my book and a lot of the effects that are being studied of these compounds are anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antioxidant, gut healing, mood boosting, digestion boosting, brain enhancing effects and on and on and on. So really is quite remarkable to see all of that ancient intuitive knowledge now being validated um, in the lab. So any questions so far before I read from the spice section, um, and I want to start with the obvious one, <laughs> no surprise, which was turmeric. And I will say this, I don't know if you guys find it um, kind of exasperating, but the pronunciation of turmeric in the West, <laughs> some reason, every, someone decided to call it turmeric, and everywhere I go, I'm like, turmeric, guys, look at the spelling. <laughs> so it is turmeric, um, but if you say turmeric, it's okay. Any questions so far? Yes. So I don't know if you want to touch upon it, but I wanted to know um, uh, how important it is to have organic versus yeah. you know, the regular, uh, because that's a new demand, people think. If you put organic in front of any spice, it just seems more authentic, which is, I believe, not, because you know everything grows. But, I mean, if you could throw light on that. It's yeah, it's a great it question. I mean, I think organic is really having a moment, and I would argue that it's a good thing that it's having a moment. Um, we have polluted our food supply chain with so many chemicals and pesticides, and, of course, different plants and different vegetables are sensitive at different degrees to these pesticides when it comes to being incorporated into the flesh of the plant. Spices, I think, are very, very susceptible because they're really tiny, they're heavily sprayed because they're very, very difficult to harvest. Yield is affected, all those things. I mean, I'm not in spice agribusiness, but I know that, for example, cardamom that grows in India is so heavily sprayed that the farmers actually call it a pesticide bomb, right? It's very, very sensitive to... Um, bugs and sort of, yeah. you know, reduced yield, right? So the, par the problem with pesticides, as we know, is multifold. One is that when we ingest large amounts of pesticides through our food supply, it causes, it causes disease, I mean, ultimately, right? It affects our microbiome, it affects our digestive tract, it, it's absorbed through our kind of somewhat permeable digestive tract, which is becoming more permeable thanks to modern day stresses and going around the body, so our body is now exposed to this slew of chemicals which are foreign, causing inflammation. So we know that um, for many reasons, I do think it's worth going the extra mile to procure organic when you can. That said, for some people, I mean, most people in this room have access to organic, many people don't. So I always say start with earth-grown nutrients, fresh fruits, vegetables, if you can't do organic, just start with those, and then if you can do organic, you're gonna be doing a bigger favor to your health. 
Um, so I think spices are no exception, and I would say if you can source pesticide-free spices, you're going to be better off. Also, the um, I think as you buy as as a whole product, not not a powder. Yeah, it's, I about talk about egg, yeah I talk powder. about that a lot in the book as well. So spices are living, kind of breathing, plant-based, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful things, and they have a shelf life. They don't necessarily go bad, but mm -hmm. a lot of their benefits come from these volatile compounds like cinnamaldehyde, curcumin. These are volatile compounds. So volatile means they are sensitive to oxygen and light and humidity. So if you grind the spice down and you activate the volatile compound, it's a good thing, but eventually that volatile compound is just going to evaporate and lose its potency. So really you want to um, use ground spices in small amounts, kind of like how our grannies did, right? Like everybody had this small little spice box with small amounts of ground spices, you use it up, and then you grind a fresh batch because the whole spice tends to retain the volatile compound in a more stable fashion. So you're better off buying the whole spice and grinding small amounts and using it up. And also storing it away from heat and light. Don't put it near don't put it near the stove or the microwave. You know, keep it in a cool, dark place in an airtight container, ideally. So yeah, a lot of those ancient practices just kind of honor them and see where they're coming from. Um, so I will read my turmeric section just to give you a sense of how the book um, lays things out. When I started thinking about writing a book, I was looking for a spice book that was not just a recipe book, but a spice resource, and also that um, talked about the science of spices. And I didn't find such a book. There's lots of spice books that talk about Ayurveda, which I respect tremendously, but I really wanted to incorporate the modern scientific lens. So that was, that's why I wrote the book, because I felt like it was missing from the space. And so the first part of the book, the first 50 pages actually, um, talks about 15 spices in this way. So I'm going to dive into turmeric and then answer any questions. And if we have time, we can also read about one more spice, which is cinnamon, uh, where I think there's some really cool information that people are not often aware of. So this is the section uh, that I called Get Smart About Spices. And the 15 spices that I cover are turmeric, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, paprika, cayenne, coriander, cumin, black pepper, star anise, uh, or anise, however you want to say it, cardamom, sumac, saffron, carom, which is ajwain in India, and fennel. Mm -hmm. So many of these spices are familiar to Indians, but a couple like sumac and star anise may not be as familiar. And they're very interesting from a health-boosting perspective. So the way I lay out each spice, so turmeric. Turmeric has been revered as food and medicine for over 4,000 years, maybe even 5,000. Ayurveda, the ancient Indian medical system, celebrated turmeric as a cure-all, naming it Jayanti, which literally means that which is victorious over all ailments. And it's just funny to see now people literally inhaling turmeric for everything, from mm -hmm. arthritic pains, to mood boost, you know, for mood boosting effects, for digestion, for cancer prevention, I mean, for so many things. <laughs> it is really kind of amazing. 5,000 years later, they were right. So what it is, turmeric is the underground stem or rhizome, as we call it in botany. Oops. Actually, I don't need this anymore. Um, of the plant curcuma longa of the ginger family. So if you've seen an actual turmeric rhizome or stem, it looks really similar to ginger, except fresh turmeric rhizomes look like ginger with a hint of orange on the skin. The fiery, almost fluorescent orange interior explains why turmeric is called the golden spice, or we call it Indian saffron, actually. So fresh turmeric has a peppery and vibrant flavor. Most turmeric, however, is consumed in powdered form in which it also has sweet, warm, and bitter notes. Then I say, then I talk about my favorite spice pairings. So my favorite turmeric pairings, just to give people sort of a wide range of options. If they, you know, for us, it's really obvious to put turmeric in all our vegetables, our dals, our curries. But for people who don't cook that way every day, these are some suggestions. So scrambled eggs, oatmeal, overnight oats, chia pudding, Coconut milk, mango popsicles, curry stew soups, shrimp, chicken, fish, green beans, cauliflower, potatoes, cabbage, okra, yellow, red lentils, popcorn, turmeric lattes. And then here's a note. 
some manufacturers, and we should really listen up. This is actually something that um, Anu Segal, who's one of the organizers of the, the Kids Literary Festival of uh, Culture Tree, and I have been sharing this message. So we um, were approached by the New York Department of Public Health, the New York City Department of Public Health, which found that South Asians, so us, we and our children have to happen to have very high levels of lead in our blood. And this can sometimes be traced to spices that have been contaminated with things like lead chromate. So there's a note here in my book that says, some manufacturers use lead chromate to enhance the weight and color of turmeric powders. Lead laced turmeric is more orangey red than yellow. And lead in high enough quantities we know can be a neurotoxin, damage the brain and cause developmental delays, particularly in children. Steer clear of unlabeled or unknown turmeric brands from ethnic shops. So these lead-laced spices were literally found enriched in spices that were brought back with like sort of no brand name, you know, just, so it is really important to do your homework when it comes to some of these spices and make sure you buy it from a reputable brand. And sometimes you can even ask the brand if they've done heavy metal testing. A lot of good brands are aware of that now and will do that sort of thing. And then my favorite section for each spice is titled, Why Science Says It's Good For You. So for turmeric, anti-inflammatory, and here I get pretty sort of a little bit technical and scientific, um, which, you know, is just meant to educate. You can just look at the titles or you can dive deep. And there's even um, research references at the back of the book. So every time I make a scientific claim, I've cited the research paper that the claim came from. So for turmeric anti-inflammatory. Curcumin, a compound in turmeric, blocks a molecule called NF-kappa B, which is the master conductor in the orchestra of inflammation. You may be wondering why blocking NF-kappa B is a good thing. After all, isn't inflammation part of our natural defense system? While some inflammation helps fight infections and promotes healing, unchecked chronic inflammation is damaging like wildfire and forms the basis of many chronic diseases, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even depression. Anti-cancer, research has shown that curcumin slows cancers of various organs, including the lung, breast, skin, and colon. Given its poor absorption into the bloodstream, there's a note on that below, it may be more promising for cancers of the esophagus and gut where it can exert its benefits without having to be absorbed. And I will read about that absorption issue because it's really important when we think about turmeric and health. <clears throat> then I talk about brain health boosting. So curcumin enhances the synthesis of a very important omega-3 fatty acid called docosahexanoic acid or DHA in the body. Low levels of DHA are associated with cognitive defects, anxiety and depression, DHA is either obtained through the diet, with fish oil being the best source, or can be synthesized, albeit inefficiently, from a precursor molecule called alpha-linolenic acid found in vegetarian sources like flax seeds and walnuts. <coughs> Curcumin increases DHA production in the brain and reduces anxiety levels in animals. Therefore, vegetarian diets or diets low in fish may benefit from more turmeric. So it's really like, you know, pretty... Um, I tried to highlight the science, but also give you some actionable takeaways that you can kind of put into practice in your life using these spices for different benefits. And then I'll just read about the, um, actually I love this one, so gut healing. People don't think of turmeric as gut healing, but it really is quite remarkable. So curcumin, again, the bioactive in turmeric, increases the levels of intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which is a molecule, a protein in the gut, that forms tight junctions between the cells lining the digestive tract, maintaining its integrity and preventing leaky gut. Curcumin also promotes bile secretion by the gallbladder to aid digestion and was able to prevent gas and bloating in a small human trial. Um, and then the note, which I think is really, really critical, is the bioavailability of curcumin is improved by black pepper. So I talk about how curcumin has very poor bioavailability. It's rapidly cleared from the stomach and the liver after consumption before it has a chance to get into the bloodstream. And you can improve this bioavailability by pairing curcumin with black pepper, which is why it's always paired with black pepper in something like garam masala. Um, and the addition of piperin, the active compound in pepper, reduces the rate at which turmeric is cleared by the liver and allows it to enter the bloodstream. 
So lots of <laughs> sciencey, um, actionable, hopefully, tips in each of the spice sections. So this was just turmeric, and this is a similar section for 14 other spices, and then sort of diving into how you can incorporate these spices in your food. Um, I'll read the final note in this section, which is because people ask me all the time, how much turmeric should I take? You know, how much is needed? So it is estimated that 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams of curcumin a day are required to see therapeutic effects. So that means you're already sick and you're trying to cure a particular disease, which would translate to amounts much greater than one would consume through food. To, to treat a disease, curcumin supplements can be considered after consulting with your physician. In culinary amounts, it's best to be viewed as a preventative rather than a cure for disease, and people with gallstones should not use large amounts of turmeric or curcumin. So hopefully that's um, you know just helpful and useful and something, like I said, I felt was missing from the spice kind of book field. Um, so yeah, that's how the book is laid out. And then of course, you know, recipes with different ingredients, including the spices. Um, any questions? Yes. What anything happens to you by cooking? Yeah, it gets it so I didn't read that part, which is up in the uh, front, but basically it gets, um, curcumin becomes more activated when you provide, when you provide heat. So the traditional method of putting the turmeric in oil or ghee is actually backed by science to really activate the beneficial compounds. And then you pair it with black pepper on top of that. Yeah. So I don't recommend putting it into like raw smoothies. Yes. I, mean, I missed the oh, beginning, sorry. so this question may be entirely redundant. No but, problem. Um, uh, do you address the antiquity of the use of spices and the early knowledge in ancient India, um, presumably in Ay early Ayurvedic? Um, is there, I mean, we know of the substantial trade in spices from the Malabar uh, yeah. to uh, the Roman world in the early centuries, uh, common era, um, uh, and spices including black pepper uh, um, from Kerala was a major component of that. Um, were the curative properties well understood and recorded from an early time? Right. So yeah, for over five, excuse me, for over five thousand years, um, Ayurveda has been, you know, inspiring the use of spices for various medicinal purposes. The book really tries to cast more of a modern scientific light on a lot of those ancient claims, but. A lot of these claims that I'm talking about from a scientific lens were the same claims that were made by the ancient physicians, so it is really quite remarkable. <laughs> there's a couple of uh, situations where there's a discrepancy, which I find really interesting. So, for example, with cinnamon, Ayurveda thinks of cinnamon as a very heat-inducing spice, which is why it's you know we, we say it's like heaty, like it's something you want to have in the colder months. But actually, the science shows us that it can have a cooling effect on the digestive tract. So it can actually lower the temperature in your gut. So it may be helpful for sort of hyper acidity issues. So there's some interesting discrepancies, but for the most part, the ancient wisdom really does stand up to the science. Thank you. Yeah. So if I'm trying to take curcumin to treat a disease, yes, um, and I want to take, take it in a very potent form, um, can I take, consume just the curcumin extract from the haldi? Right. It's a fantastic question. So curcumin is the, the best studied bioactive in turmeric, but there are others. There are other as yet not as well understood bioactive compounds in turmeric. So you can start with a concentrated curcumin supplement. It's not going to hurt you, and it probably has a lot of benefits, especially if it's formulated correctly and has pepper in there and some sort of fat source, or your physician might guide you to take the supplement and then have some sort of fat on the side, like nuts or even like a coconut milk-based something, right? So you're providing that fat environment for the optimal absorption. But you would be technically missing out on the as yet unstudied bioactives. So a lot of supplement companies are now creating concentrated whole turmeric supplements. So it's you're, you're getting all the slew of kind of um, bioactives beyond curcumin. It's just something to think about and really research the different supplement options. And obviously always talk to your physician. And like I said, the only contraindication is the gallstones. So if you have a gallstone history or in the family, you might want to not overdo the turmeric. Um, but yeah, I mean, the 
point that I made was if you are trying to treat a disease, you're not going to be able to get enough curcumin and bioactives just by using the turmeric in food alone. You really will need a concentrated supplement, and then you have to decide if you want the whole turmeric concentrate or just the curcumin, or maybe even both. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you said not to put turmeric in your green juices, but I use the raw yes. turmeric and I take the juice out, or actually just the pieces. Yeah. And I put it in my... Yeah, it's fine. You know, it's the idea is so turmeric's doing so many different things in the body. So if your concern or your goal is to enhance gut health and to allow turmeric to heal your gut lining and to re prevent inflammation in the gut, you're going to get those benefits by putting it raw into a smoothie, no problem, because it's going to do its thing as it traverses your GI tract. But if you want it to be absorbed into your bloodstream and go to what we call systemic organs like the brain or like your knees or wherever there is like inflammation, you do want to think about the fact that the raw turmeric not paired with black pepper is going to be cleared by the liver rather than get absorbed into the blood. So it's, it's wise in those situations to warm it in a fat source and then combine it with pepper. But you're still going to get benefits for gut health even by using it raw in a smoothie. So when I say don't use it raw in a smoothie, what I mean is don't just use it that way, which a lot of Westerners do because they don't necessarily cook with the spice. So they just put it, they put a giant heaping teaspoon in their smoothie and they think they're done, but they're only getting a limited range of benefits that way. I was wondering, when you were talking about Columbus, yeah. and uh, were they going... Do you know, were, were they going more for the flavor agents of spices, or was it also very much a medicine for them? And on the other hand, now I'm thinking after hearing your talk, they probably didn't know what to do with most of that <laughs> stuff. All I can think of is like, you know, the cinnamon cloves and, yeah. and nutmeg in, in pies in, in the Western... So, foods. yeah, such, a, such an awesome question. Um, I think they were going... So it seems like they were aware of the medicinal properties and they were going after the spices for multiple reasons. The main reason actually seems to be food preservation. So before refrigeration... A lot of these spices have antimicrobial properties, so they would just use them to keep food longer, and that was, you know, a game changer when we had, like, sort of limited resources and really needed to avoid famine and that sort of thing. So that was a big part of the motivation as well. Thank you. Sure. Now, yes. The way that mycology has kind of shown a lot about mushrooms, I mean, yeah. it does, has your, the science shown that there are any spices that are actually kind of have an ill effect or the way that too much salt is, is bad for your health in either combination or by themselves? Has the science shown any of that? Yeah, there are a couple of examples. So I love that you brought that up. Um, actually, that's a great segue to talk about cinnamon, right? So cinnamon is one of the most widely used spices. It's really... People find it more accessible and kind of easy to use it. If you ask people, what are you least scared of, they'll say cinnamon. Turns out there's two kinds of cinnamon. And the widely available variety is called cassia cinnamon. And then there's a special variety that grows that grew originally in Sri Lanka, so it's called Ceylon cinnamon, but it can grow outside Sri Lanka as well. It's called true cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon. Now, if you have large amounts of cinnamon, which a lot of people are doing these days for diabetes control because there's studies linking it to improve insulin function, um, they will OD on cinnamon, but if they're using the cassia variety, they might be accidentally causing a liver toxicity issue because cassia cinnamon has a compound called coumarin, which at high enough doses can cause liver toxicity. So that's an example of where more is too much for a certain type of spice. Yeah. There's other examples. So nutmeg, actually, I don't know if you guys know, but it used to be abused as a recreational drug. So you can actually ingest enough nutmeg to cause hallucinations and even seizures. So, and in, the pr in prisons, it used to be literally snorted to cause hallucinations. So there's a cautionary note about, I actually say, um, nutmeg has a dark side and ability to cause a drug-like haze and even hallucinations when consumed in very large amounts. So in this regard, the spice has, been, has seen some abuse leading to a few cases of nutmeg poisoning. Rarely fatal, but definitely unpleasant. <laughs> Um, and then large quantities, like two or more tablespoons of nutmeg, can cause nausea, dizziness, and heart palpitations. These less desirable effects are linked to the compound meristocin, which also confers nutmeg with beneficial properties. So it's one of those trade-offs. In some cases, really less is more. Like they say, the dose makes the poison. 
So I love that you asked that question. There's a couple. There's probably just one other example, where, um, for example, clove, which has this compound called eugenol. So I've provided that kind of information for spices where we know too much is not a good idea. So excess consumption of clove could lower blood sugar to very low levels in people who are already hypoglycemic. And clove oil applied topically can irritate the skin and cause bleeding. Overconsumption of clove may also increase bleeding due to eugenol, which is a blood thinner. So great question. <laughs> I yes. wonder if you ever heard this thing about cinnamon. You probably have that. Uh, in some people, when they were showing their home to sell their house, yeah, they would be, they would be advised to uh, uh, cook something with cinnamon so that the house would smell a little cinnamony, and mm -hmm. that supposedly would make make illicit like better. more buyers. Very, to yeah, very <laughs> homey friendly. Yes. Oh no, I have not. That's amazing. So the apple side, the yeah. Well, it does have that warm, comforting holiday vibe. Yeah. So yeah. they do yeah. say, you know, make a pie and 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 yeah, with cinnamon on it, so that it's uh, it's warm. Yes. And it uh, it fills up. So that's a very common, uh, in old days at least, in the yes. house selling business was uh, put a little uh, cinnamon pie. Yeah, cinnamon yeah, yeah. Pie. It is a very it's like a very oh, festive, awesome. warming. Yes. I just want to add a comment about that. Uh, we have not been able to even make a single medicine which does not have a side effect, uh, even in the therapeutic doses. So from that <coughs> perspective, all these spices which yeah. we can use for our, and it's like prevention is better than cure. Yeah. So that's what they are doing is the prevention part of it, which if taken in the right amount, as she said, can be helpful for so many things. And a lot of things for which we don't even have cure about, mm -hmm. say, common cold, we see it every day. We don't have anything against it except for these wonderful things which we can advise mm -hmm. them to take and not to take any medications which can have a lot of side effects. In yeah, I mean, you know, I think I really think modern medicine has a powerful place in uh, mm -hmm. treatment, but that should not be, in my opinion, the first place you go to. Um, first of all, people should really be focusing on prevention. Yes. Our culture doesn't focus on it because there's no money in prevention. So doctors aren't going to sit there and tell you eat broccoli. They're going to tell you take a statin or take, you know. Um, but really, prevention is the ultimate solution um, to our health crisis. I believe that deeply. And I think the reason, I mean, it's a great point because actually, so speaking of pharmaceuticals and spices and side effects, the most powerful antiviral drug in the world, which is called Tamiflu, actually comes from star anise. So mm -hmm. the, the compound in star anise called shikimic acid is literally the starting point in the synthesis of Tamiflu. So I always tell people, if you're battling the flu, make a spice chai with star anise, mm -hmm. um, where you're getting that same compound, probably not in as high doses as Tamiflu, but you know. So most pharmaceutical drugs come from nature. We start with a compound and then we iterate and we we do medicinal chemistry and we change its structure, but it starts from nature very often. Aspirin, all the antibiotics, right? But I, I, just, I disagree with you, doctors saying only don't eat broccoli, just eat the satins. You disagree? She, she, she doesn't even she, she does No, I mean, I think, that, I think it's changing. I think doctors are becoming much more well-versed with the power of prevention and food as medicine, but traditionally, and it's, I, I don't blame the doctors, I also blame us as a society and patients. Patients want to go in and they want a tablet. They want a magic bullet. They don't want exercise more, move more, sleep more, manage stress, and eat more vegetables. That's boring. They're like, give me a pill. So it's really a combination, and I think everybody's waking up to the need for more prevention, definitely. Do you have a picture of the, these two cinnamons? Yeah, I also read this Casio... It's really dangerous now. I mean, like I said, cinnamon looks like. Yeah, so the typical cinnamon stick that we Indians are familiar with, with, with the thick Just bark the that's like low, rolled over, that's cassia cinnamon. I don't have it with me, but I often show the two cinnamons. The, the true cinnamon has like a multi-layered flaky bark. But you will, you, you should be able to tell from the bottle. So a true cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon will say on the bottle that it's true or Ceylon cinnamon. If it doesn't say it's true or Ceylon cinnamon, you can assume it's cassia cinnamon. And high amounts, yes. Yes. So, my favorite spice is <laughs> saffron. Oh, mm. amazing, yeah. So, uh, what are they? Uh, I mean, uh, I do cover it. Is that covered in your book? Because, it's covered in my book. I mean, book. it's the. Uh, 
I mean, it's Prozac, it's a libido, it's exactly. good for the heart, it's antioxidant, it's like... You could have written my book, it's exactly it's all these everything. things covered in there. The, the Plus most... my wife makes the best <laughs> saffron camera, so you know what's not to like. Yeah, saffron actually has been very extensively studied for its anti-depression effects and also um, for prevention of ADHD or reduction of ADHD symptoms in children, so it's really amazing. Yeah, it's a really, and I think it's underutilized because people like have never seen it. They think it's super expensive, which it is yeah. weight-wise, but you don't need a lot to to create that color and flavor and yeah. Also, I think they think that saffron is a winter spice. Right. So a lot of people don't use it during the summertime. It's considered very you know Heating, degenerating. Yeah, so yeah. That, that is definitely. That, I didn't see any evidence um, supporting or refuting that. So we'll just have to <coughs> trust the ancients in that regard. Is nutmeg, is nutmeg supporting? No. Nutmeg, no. What do we call nutmeg in Hindi? I'm not sure. Jeffal. Uh, it's the one that you. Oh, it's all it in Dharma. It's like the nut and you can it's it's like the nut and you can it's nutmeg. Yeah. Yeah, you can it's, it looks like supari, yeah. but then it's It's a whole nutmeg and people. It's a whole, it's like walnut? It's like a walnut, yeah. yeah. It's bitter. Yeah, it's a little bitter. It's a little bitter. Yeah, it's a little bitter. Yeah, it's a little bitter. Yeah, it's a little Yeah, it's a little bitter. 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 Yeah,
Um, I would say turmeric is a great one because oftentimes when one is suffering or struggling with excess body weight, there is usually chronic inflammation that accompanies that for many reasons, which you know is a topic for a different day. But if you can just add more anti-inflammatory foods to your diet and bring that sort of chronic inflammation down, um, that can really help as well. But like I'll just say, ultimately, it's about just eating more real food, yeah. you know, moving, all the boring things that we all know we have to do. <laughs> yes. And one more comment just to add about the psychiatric illnesses. I found like it's much more common in Western society and less so in uh, India and other parts of the world. It also, to some extent, is associated with our food and spices and those kinds of things too, besides being the cultural bonding and family and all that. Mm -hmm. So that also kind of um, has some roots uh, towards the point to the kind of yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to her comment that that's really brilliant what you're doing with your child because in my case, my kids are now older, but I always did home remedy as soon as they had any any illness. First thing, I never took them to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Really, I'm really blessed that way. But first thing is I would give them a juan or or mm -hmm. you know pepper and, and honey or any that's cold and cough or ginger tea. And they used to make faces, and they, half the time they would get well, knowing that mommy is going to do the home remedy. They would say, no, no, I'm fine. But I see that it's now, it's coming back. You're yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing they do is, oh, I had ginger tea today. Oh, oh you've I taught them for that. That's amazing. So they are watching you, they're listening. And that's the only way we can pass it on and let the, you know, the, uh, the heritage. Live. Well, it's like when I would have the haldi do, I yeah. would literally gag and close exactly. my nose. But now, look, I mean, look, so yes. you're planting really important seeds, even if they're making faces and not that's into right. it. I give him haldi do, then I show him the picture. See, kanchan auntie. So he drinks it. <laughs> No, I agree with you on the spices. I did the same with my kids, and my son just went to college, and the first thing he did was go to Whole Foods and buy tea, and he bought turmeric. Yes. Wow. And all through the years that he was growing up, they would rub their noses at our table. So I, I certainly agree with you. My question was about consulting a physician and yeah. taking high doses. I have done that. I've yeah. done it both with my primary care physician and with my oncologist. Yeah. And both said, we are not like... We are not qualified to yeah. give an opinion. <laughs> no, no comment, basically. Right. And don't overdo anything. Yeah. But I am overdoing the haldi. I know that because yeah. I'm taking it in a very potent form. I'm also taking raw haldi created with, you know, yeah. oil and yeah. black pepper. It generates a lot of heat in my body. Yeah. So, you I know, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think, unfortunately, we don't know yet. We have, there's been no control studies that say this amount is okay and then this amount is too much. Overall, people have done sort of smaller studies on supplements and found that it seems to be pretty safe and well tolerated, except for that gallstone issue that I mentioned. If you talk to an Ayurvedic practitioner, they will tell you probably too much is too much and especially depending on your particular constitution type. So maybe that's one approach to take, is to try to meet with a really well-qualified Ayurvedic practitioner and just say, what could be the downsides? Given that the modern research hasn't figured it out yet, is there a downside to too much, given my risks and my sort of, you know, what you're trying to treat and prevent? So but it's not a black and white, answer. yeah, and I think physicians are too, they don't yeah, know. They don't want to also give you the answer. Right, right. in case you're like something, you know, exactly, we don't know. That's always the concern with supplements. But also insurance doesn't cover it, so I guess. And I, but I do think in certain cases there's a place for them, you know, and like if you look at Okinawa, Japan, which has been studied as a blue zone where people live till well over 100, they actually drink fermented turmeric tea every single day. Um, there's obviously multiple things they do that probably contributes to their longevity and improved health span, but they seem to be ODing on it every day. So <coughs> I don't know. There isn't a black and white answer, but I would suggest maybe talking to an Ayurvedic practitioner. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. May I Thank ask you. a couple of yes. questions? Yes. So uh, in some sense, you are sort of an evangelist of this movement, and I'm curious the first wave out of India's traditional body of knowledge was really yoga. And mm -hmm. yoga now is 
become near universal, you know. Many people probably don't even know it originated from India, <laughs> right? And we're beginning to see now that the next wave is Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Dr. Frawley and uh, he told me there are 1,200 Ayurvedic teachers in Russia alone. So clearly there's a second wave. Do you see a spice wave? Do you see as you watch your followers, do you see people beginning to say, hey, spices are part of my prevention way of life and I need to get educated and I need to make it part of my daily life? Do you see that wave? I definitely see a food as medicine wave. So okay. spices are a really important part of that, and mm -hmm. I think people are very interested in learning more. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally this idea that Mother Nature has provided us with some really incredible things to eat on a regular basis, whether it's spices, whether it's herbs, whether it's certain types of vegetables like the cruciferous vegetables, um, other types of you know green leafy vegetables, this idea that we can really create an environment of optimal health mm -hmm. just through earth-grown mm -hmm. nutrients, mm -hmm. so definitely there's a wave. So I think we should all feel very proud as Indians about our the primacy we attach to spices in our life. Two small stories, Kanchan, perhaps uh, maybe new for you too. We can all, as Indians, proudly label ourselves as the greatest spice robbers of history <laughs> because uh, it was an Indian who went to Arabia and stole the carefully guarded coffee bean mm. and brought it to India. And it's from India coffee then spread all over the world. And so that was a desire. Mm. And I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating story. And uh, there's a shrine to him. He was a Muslim gentleman who had gone mm. to Mecca and uh, the Arabs, I mean, if they thought you were stealing the beans, they would chop mm -hmm. your head off. He brought them in his cane. So there's a whole story, you can go read it. But something that's a greater story and of great antiquity, because, uh, and is John here? He, would have, uh, he probably walked out, he'd enjoy this, in terms of the role that spices played in tying India culturally to the rest of humanity. The incense that was burned in the temple of Solomon, since the time of Moses, the formula of that incense composition is written down. It has not deviated. The temple of Solomon was destroyed, but that <coughs> incense formula has not been deviated from. One third of that incense was costus. Costus was only a plant that was found in Kashmir. So it used to go from Kashmir all the way to Israel, to the Temple of Solomon. So you're on to something magnificent <laughs> here as part of our culture, as part of our way of life, as part of something that was designed for humanity universally. More power to you. We are delighted you're part of IAC's family. We hope you'll stay for some of the sessions if you have some time. And we'll take a break at 11.45 a.m. We have absolutely a fascinating talk by John Guy. It's very rare, and thanks to Rajiv Kaul, board member of IAC, that we have been able to get him to come. He's, as you know, the head of the Metropolitan Museum's uh, South Asia collection. And he's just a treasure trove, like you are in your field. He'll talk about his new book that uh, uh, is about an extraordinary painter from India. And so we'll take a break, we'll come back, and we'll pick up. We have a great two days planned for you. <coughs> I'm telling you, each each author is an evangelist, and uh, we're so proud you're part of us. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me and for all the